Hello Floss Tube. this is Michelle at the Striped Rose and it is Saturday the 13th and this is my fourth podcast episode. Um, I wanted to thank everybody who has commented, who has subscribed, who has returned to watch another video and I've been listening to people thank their podcast viewers and talk about what this community means to them and it reminded me of a quotation by C.S. Lewis and I'd like to read that to you. Um, this is from his book, The Four Loves. The typical expression of opening friendship would be something like, what, you too? I thought I was the only one. And I think that that um, really says a lot about floss tube. When you have a hobby that is not common to many people around you and you're able to reach out to find this enormous community of like-minded individuals, or at least like-minded in, in their hobby. All right, so I wanted to start out by showing you um, a whip or a UFO is what it's actually been for quite some time that I found when I was digging through my plastic tub. Um, I think in the last video I showed you a magazine, an older Just Cross Stitch magazine and there was a design in there. This is the top half of that design, and I said it would look so nice, just the top half of the design as a cushion. And then I said, oh, I think I actually remember, remember starting that. I started it, oops, sorry, and actually have gotten a good bit done on it. This, this must have been 15 years ago, 10 years ago, I can't even imagine. And the stitching, um, is not that bad. Um, I was thinking, you know, I'd really like to have that pillow, but I'm going to have to just start it all over. But I think I could live with these stitches on a cushion. Um, oh, that's a lot of colors to try to kit up again, but there really can't be that much more left on it. So that may move into the whip pile. But that was just a follow-up from um, the last podcast, the last podcast. So I have two finishes and you've probably seen them on Instagram. Um, when I post things on Instagram, I usually realize at that point that I haven't actually finished them. And that is the case with this one. Um, Wuthering Heights is not weathering all the way. So this is um, just ivory, antique ivory, 32 count linen with the called for DMC threads. Now there was a DMC metallic called for for the gold binding and I think the buttons on somebody's dress maybe. And I, I, I'm not, I don't like gold thread. Um, I actually bought some petite treasure braid because I've heard people rave about it on floss tube and I thought I'd try that and I did try it. I tried it one strand, I tried two strands, I tried mixing it with, <laughs> I tried all kinds of different yellows and the one that I eventually settled on was the yellow that was already called for um, for this, the center of these daisies, the center of these red flowers, um, Little Women, uh, is that Amy with her blonde hair? So I just decided to go ahead and use, maybe it's 3045, I'm not sure, use it wherever it called for the gold binding and I'm perfectly, perfectly happy with that. I, I, unless you just really like using metallics, I, I don't see why you wouldn't do that. It looks perfectly fine to me. So this is the bookshelf. Um, I didn't go out and pick out Dickinson and put in Potter because I realized that we, this year we actually have memorized a couple Dickinson poems. Um, the girls make fun of them. They try to make them rhyme um, to entertain themselves. They, they think it's hysterical to try to make her poetry rhyme where they think it should rhyme. Um, so since we have been doing that, I decided to leave Dickinson in. Also, I was going to replace her with Potter for Beatrix Potter, but as I'll show you in a few minutes, I have plenty of Beatrix Potter cross-stitch. 
I put the umlaut, I don't know what you, if that's what you call an umlaut in English, but I put an umlaut over the E in Bronte because it needed to be there. And the other thing that bothered me was these waves on Wuthering Heights. Um, did I finish those windows yet? I decided I just wanted it done. The waves were pretty, uh, the waves were staying. I, I just didn't want to deal with it. Now, if I hadn't been in such a hurry, um, after I, I had finished it, I started thinking, you know what you could do is you could replace those waves with some sort of flower motif. Maybe not this one right here, um, but maybe you could find one on another Little House Needleworks pattern. Um, and, or even take this one, but put, I don't know, to make it into Heather. Isn't that what grows out on the moor? I don't know, Heather, purple, or is it broom? Well, what grows on the moor? Like something yellow, something purple to make some sort of more looking flower and put that there. I was thinking purple. And then the only other place that blue is on the design is in the dress right here. So you could easily, if you have dark purple, put that there. Um, but I thought about that afterwards, but I just, I just wanted to stitch it. I didn't want to Oh, I didn't want to chart and redesign it. I just wanted to stitch it and make it pretty and have it done. And so I did. I have it done. Except for Wuthering. I need that G. Okay. Can I help you? No. Get fruit. Apples, bananas, pears. Um, I also finished... What is that? Flex seeds everywhere. Um, I also finished French Harvest Basket <clears throat> and I just need to go and put my initials on it somewhere. I don't think I put my initials on that one over there either, but I really like it. It's so much smaller than I thought it would be, but that's fine because I can uh, find a more easily find a place to put it, but I think it's beautiful. This is um, heartstring samplery harvest basket and it was charted with a word or lay something across the bottom um, but I decided I wanted mine like the original antique Bella there's a blonde hair somewhere showing up on the camera there's only one blonde in this house um, so I think that's beautiful it's beautiful it didn't take long um, it could go it could go anywhere so so I had two finishes so I had to do some starts which is never any problem at all to find starts so the first thing I did um, oh dear. so you know sample sampler and antique needlework quarterly is no longer in print and but you can buy the DVD, the D, what are those things where you print things from? Like DVD ROMs, CD ROMs, DVD, you can buy the discs. What are they called? Discs. Go, go away. You can buy the discs. I think I got mine, is it, is it Annie's? And you can print them. And, um, I like having, I like have, knowing that I have the whole collection. I have all the sampler and antique needlework quarterlies. I have all the articles, I have all the charts, I can print the charts, and I'm glad. But I, um, my back still hurts, and I've been on the couch a lot this week, and I have been flipping through old sampler and antique needlework quarterlies, the ones that I have, and I enjoy that so much. I enjoy reading the articles. I enjoy looking at the collections of samplers. I really, really enjoy that. I don't enjoy putting a disc into a computer and flipping through. Um, so, but it's much cheaper, of course, to have the DVDs. So anyways, that is to say, this next design was in, I think, I have it written down. 
I think this was in, I printed it, so I don't have the picture to show you. This was called Rosewood. Oh, I have the information somewhere. Rosewood. Oh. All right. I can tell you about it. This is called Rosewood Basket Pincushion, and it is designed by Nicoletta Ferralto of Nikki's Creations. And it, I printed it out from um, Sampler and Antique Needlework Quarterly Spring 2015. That's where you can find this. And it, um, this is a piece of 32 count antique ivory. And it's the call for threads are DMC and I've used the, the call for threads. Um, I need to finish this flower. I don't know, I think that's a fox. There's gonna be a bird here one more stylized motif there and then the handle of the urn and there's no real reason why I couldn't have finished it up for po the podcast that's what people say that the podcast inspires them to go ahead and finish things and get things finished but I had a miscounting and a frogging incident so but I thought that would be so pretty as a pin keep um in a little basket. And that's something that I would have flipped through the magazine and, and not really noticed on the first pass. And that's what happens to me a lot. That's why I keep all my magazines because I notice things, especially little things. I notice them on the second and third and 13th and 23rd pass through. So I started that and that um, that didn't really make it into my rotation. I'm just doing that. So I also started a larger design by the Drawn Thread. And this is called The Marriage of Minds. It's a long, narrow sampler. And it has a bit from, uh, is it a Sonnet 116? Bella, do you know what it is? Sonnet, oh dear, CXV1. That's probably 116, right? Um, let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. And it says in the, in the chart pack that she made this for her and her husband's 20th anniversary. And it says in there, so in the, the poem it says, it is an ever fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. And in the design, she has her marriage dates, her anniversary dates, and she says 20 tempestuous years. And so my husband and I were married in 1997. Will you please take the puppy dog out, please? And we have had 20 tempestuous years. So um, I thought that I could begin this in our 20th anniversary year. I guess this is actually our 21st, the beginning of our 21st. Well, I finally started it. So I started it on, this is 40 count vintage light exemplar. No, it's just light exemplar. It's not vintage. I never buy the vintage. And if you'll see here, this is another one of the pieces, the fabrics, that I started The Heart Lives Where It Loves on, and I just couldn't get good enough coverage of that red. Um, so I just began this tree up here at the top. And that's all I've done is begun the tree. This is my three inches over, and it's, it's a very narrow, narrow design, especially on 40 count. It's gonna be very narrow. Um, so that will has worked its way. That will be in the rotation. I just started it one day. I was not doing mania, no matter what some people urge. I'm not doing mania because my life is is mania enough for me. Just my my daily life is about all I can handle. But you see people starting things, and you want to start things, and 
All right, so what I wanted to start next, finish two, start two, and then start more, even though it's not mania. I wanted to start Plum Street Samplers Earthly Treasures. I just think that is beautiful. When we travel, we uh, we look for we look for things. You know, I mean, um, my husband wants a bar with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of beers on tap. We want used bookstores. We want um, a tea shop where we can go in and. Um, sample lots of loose leaf teas the girls and I do that we want what else do we want in a city when we visit we want a museum I want a museum uh, Mary Margaret wants a history museum Bella wants a natural history museum I want an art museum and I want we want to go to um, historic churches and I want a good cemetery I love a good cemetery. I think it is so peaceful. It is so pleasant. Um, it's it's such an encounter when, when it's an old cemetery and you can read the words that they've chosen. Are we? Is this the gathering place now? Or are we just all going to hang out while Mommy makes her podcast? Yeah, there is some organic sandwich. Uh, Pizza. But we love, we love a good cemetery when we go on vacation, don't we? If there is a cemetery in our neighborhood. You're right. You're right. They make they they're the best neighbors in the whole neighborhood, aren't they? <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. Our neighbors are. Our neighbor over there is probably watching us. She turns her security cameras on us, and anyway. So I love a good cemetery. It's a wonderful way to connect with these people that have gone before when you read the words that they've written on their tombstones or the images um, that they've written on, written on their tombstones. I love a good cemetery. And this, um, I think is beautiful. I think it's absolutely beautiful. Now, it calls for terracotta. And I don't know, I, I must get the, <clears throat> all the off colors. I think I get all the off colors. This is just as burnt orange as it can be. Maybe persimmon. Well, it's terracotta. It's called terracotta. It's like a terracotta pot. That doesn't, I don't know. So what I think I'm going to use for that. Oh, dear. All my, uh, all my threads are gone. Y'all can't sit in there and whisper. Oh, no, here they are. My threads, my threads. I'm going to use this Valdani old brick. Um, it's got a little terracotta in it. It really does. So it's got all those colors in there. So it's got brick. It's got. So Y'all can't sit in there and whisper. Really. Get the dog out of the dishwasher, please. Puppy. Um, I love all those colors. I think that'll be, that'll be really, really good. So what's today? I was gonna start it today, but I accidentally bought. And it was my error, because I looked back, it was my error. I bought 28 count pearled barley. And I'm looking at it, and I just don't want to. I'm really excited about the design, and I, I'm not excited about 28 count. I really want to stitch it on 32. So I'm going to reorder the order correctly this time. And I think that what I'm going to do with this piece of linen is put it in a bag um, I'm going to a retreat, a stitching retreat, my very first stitching retreat with my mom um, this fall. And one of the activities you can do is bring a bag of, of cross-stitch goodies and there's some sort of a swap. And so I think um, that 28 count might make it into there because I know a lot of people like 28. Um, but I just, I just want to stitch it on 32. So. Instead of starting this today, like I have planned, I am going to start Matilda Hornbuckle. Isn't she pretty? She's so ugly, she's cute. She's just, she's weird. Oh, she's weird. This is in the 2013 cross-stitch 
um, Halloween cross stitch edition. I get all the cross stitch Halloween editions. Um, I love decorating for Halloween. Absolutely love decorating for Halloween. Oh, I'm going to tell a story about you. So you may not want to hear this. Um, I love Halloween. And when one of my daughters was probably about nine or ten. No, no, you were like seven or eight. It was so bad. She became terrified of Frankenstein. I never showed her Frankenstein. She watched, it was the Wishbone Frankenstein. You remember the Wishbone TV show? So she was just traumatized by Frankenstein. And so she started hating everything to do with Halloween. And so I... We would go into the store and they would have Halloween decorations up and like the stylized green Frankenstein with, and she would freak out and wouldn't go in the store. And so I knew something had to be done because that just wasn't gonna, that wasn't, we couldn't do that. So genius that I am, I started showing them the monsters because of course Herman is a Frankenstein character and who could be scared of Herman? Who could be scared of Herman? And it did the trick. It, it absolutely did the trick. Now the only thing, the only problem we have is some people in our home think the Munsters is the better show. Uh, 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 and some people know that it's the Adams Family is the better show. So um, they, they watch both of them. They know they could play Trivial Pursuit with the Adams Family and the Munsters and just they could blow that blow that game out of the water. So that's how I conquered my child's fear of Halloween decorations and Frankenstein was oh, the monsters. Black tree. Oh yes. Well, so I had made these, this was probably six or seven years ago or eight years ago. I had made these Halloween ornaments. I never finished my things, but one year I got a hot glue gun and I decided I was just going to do it. And so I went out in the yard and I got this black branch and I spray painted it black and I put it in an urn that was spray painted black and I put um, polyfill, stretched it out to make it look like fog around the base of the tree and put some for cobwebs and I hung my ornaments on there. She didn't want that in the house. So anyway, that's my Halloween story. So I love decorating for Halloween. Now. I don't usually decorate with witches. They, they just not what I do. Um, no, I'm not scared. Uh, I don't usually do that, but I think she needs the hat. Um, I don't decorate with witches. I don't decorate with pilgrims either. Um, no, well, some people people decorate with pilgrims on November for Thanksgiving. Well, okay. Well, in, in Halloween, I don't decorate with witches. In November, I don't decorate with pilgrims. Just one of my hang-ups. Now, I told you about my some of my hang-ups. I don't like snowmen, clowns, Santa Claus, people from the Planet of the Apes, man rabbits, pumpkin heads, and scarecrows. Don't bother me. I really like them. I like pumpkin heads. I like Ichabod Crane. Now, one of the reasons that I want to make her, besides the fact that she's so ugly, she's cute, is I think she will be the perfect companion to this design that I did years ago and did not sign or date. What? No? It's another little pumpkin head guy. I think this is not Forgotten Farm. And I don't think it was in a magazine. I think I bought it. But isn't he the cutest? I don't know why this appeals to me so much. Maybe it's because I just like pumpkin heads. But I love him. <clears throat> and I think he and she will have a long, beautiful relationship. I think they're both so ugly they're cute. So, that is what I'm planning on doing this afternoon. Um, the only problem with that is I'm not supposed to be sitting with my back right now I'm not supposed to be sitting so I'm not really sure how that how that is supposed to um, they told me I could sit to eat so I'll lie down to eat today and sit to podcast that's what I'll, that's what I'll do so those are my finishes my new starts my projected new starts um, while I've been looking through the old sampler and antique needlework quarterlies 
I found this again and fell in love with that red cow again. I love that red cow. I had started this once. I may have started it twice. I think it may have been on the wrong fabric. Um, it wasn't dark enough for the for the white to show up. It calls for um, this is in the Sampler and Antique Needlework Quarterly Summer of 2010. It calls for Pearled Barley. I don't know what I was trying to use, but I really think I might go ahead and order a piece of pearled barley um, to go ahead and kit this up on. I just, I love those flowers. I love that flower. But it's just that red cow. You know, I love samplers that have a red house on them. And it's just, I don't know, I like that red cow. I like that rose. So that's something else that I want to start. So, all right, let me, so I've been working on my rotation. I've worked on the heart lives. I have been making myself do one to two letters a day on the Grateful Heart, the big band sampler by Sharon Cohen. And most recently I finished three days on um, <clears throat> the Daughters of Longbourn, which is stitched on another, the heart lives where it's loves piece. So what I've done on this, my, um, my cherry tomato wasn't cherry tomato enough, so I switched to holly berry, which doesn't look like a big difference here, but it is a big difference in real life. Um, and I switched these colors out, just to different colors that looked more like they did in. And I started Jane's pink dress. So... Some picking out. It's not that big. Well, it's on 40 count. So I was going to say it's not going to be that much uh, taller. But I guess it'll be a long piece. So I'm excited about that. The Daughters of Longbourn. So now I'm going to show you some older stitching. Lovely Claire sent me... Um, I, I was talking about how I liked Beatrix Potter. She sent me some Beatrix Potter coins. There's the rabbit. Let's see, is that? No, no, that's Squirrel Nutkin. Squirrel Nutkin. And Jemima Puddle Duck. When Mary Margaret was little, she called her Magina. <laughs> it used to crack us up. She wanted us to read her the story about Magina Puddle Duck. <laughs> And Peter, there's Peter, and Mrs. Tiggy Winkle, love Mrs. Tiggy Winkle, um, and she also sent me some stamps, Mrs. Tiggy Winkle and Peter, so I wanted to show Claire and all of you some other Beatrix Potter, um, some Beatrix Potter cross stitches that I've done in the past. Um, I did these for my older daughter, Mary Margaret, and they still hang up in the girls' playroom. This first one is a clothesline um, with colors. So we have Miss Tiggy Winkle, and she's hanging up. Oh, I can't remember. Um, Jenny Wren, or who wore these? One of the birds or the chickens was always scratching the heels out of her stockings. Jemima. Flopsy Mopsy and Cottontail. Squirrel Nutkin. Um, Tabitha Twitchit and one of her kittens. In the blue, I don't know what the, who's the blue is. That's Jeremy Fisher and one of the mice. Sorry for the reflection. I'm having trouble holding it up. Let's see, without the reflection. So I did that. I finished it in 2001. Mary Margaret was born in 2000. I finished this in 2001. And that hangs in 
their playroom still, the girls' playroom. I did not clip my threads very well. Bella, will you take this up to Daddy and ask him to hang it back up? Um, I think the designer was Green Apple. Take both hands. No, put the chips down. <laughs> and I, um, she designed a lot of Beatrix Potter designs. So while I was pregnant, I think I stitched that after she was born. Um, this was by the same designer, Green Apple, I think. This is Benjamin Bunny, and I didn't really notice it at the time. The designer of the cross stitch made the made him green shoes to match this green tam, but his shoes are brown in the book. Um, I wasn't paying attention. He's holding, I think he's holding an onion. They had taken that handkerchief um, to go and get onions out of Mr. McGregor's garden. And later in Mrs. Tiggy Winkle, she talks about um, old Mrs. Rabbit asked her to launder this handkerchief and it did smell so of onions. So that's Benjamin. And this is my favorite. I love old Mrs. Rabbit. There she is. I don't like stitching stripes, but I really, really like her. She's one of my favorites. She and, um, oh, who's that mouse that I can't think of? Mrs. Tittlemouse. They're some of my favorite characters. And then of course, and this glass has gotten scratched by something like it's left a paint mark or something on it. And this of course is Peter with his radishes. So I've got those three hanging up above this one. And this is the Flopsy Rabbits. I like the tale of the Flopsy Rabbits. They were very cheerful and improvident. They had never quite enough to eat, so they had to go to Mr. McGregor's garden. And they found the lettuce very soporific. So those are the ones that I finished and had framed and they hung in Mary Margaret's nursery. Um, this one by the same designer green apple, I think. Um, I finished, but I never had it framed, and I'd like to have it framed in my kitchen. Those greens, I love those greens. I love them. I don't know if that's the, like the 501 family. I love those greens. But that's, um, I think it's from the story of Benjamin Bunny when they jumped into the water pail, or was that in Peter Rabbit when he jumped in the water pail? when he was hiding from Mr. McGregor. The other one that I started but never finished that was from Green Apple, um, maybe one day for grandchildren, was an alphabet. Um, and I never quite finished it. And um, it's huge, 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 huge. But maybe for grandchildren, maybe a, a wall hanging. I still have all those charts somewhere. Then the last one that I ever did, I did for one of Jerry's nephews who's now probably 16, maybe 15, maybe maybe, maybe it's just 15. He's not 16. Um, somehow or the other, I was going to make this into a door hanging. So I'm just going to put that away for grandchildren, too. And I'll show you the book. I wanted to show you the book that I got that last one out of, just the last one. Because this, I think, is worth hunting down. Storybook Favorites in Cross Stitch by Jillian Soder. Soder. I did that Angelina ballerina for Mary Margaret, too. Um, I just want to show you really quickly some of the storybooks that are represented in this book because if you like to do children's designs um, for children, small ones for children, here's Madeline and Pepito. 
the bad fact. When Mary Margaret was, she must have been two and a half, she dislocated her elbow. Um, she was at church and we were kneeling to get communion and we held her hand to take her back from the pew and she, she didn't want to. I don't think that it was she was having a religious experience. I think she just didn't want to do what we wanted her to do. But anyway, she jerked away from Jerry. And, I mean, just jerked herself away from him. And we later wound up in the the um, the walk-in medical clinic with them to look at her elbow. And she was so pitiful. And she wanted me to just say, um, in an old house in Paris that was covered with vines, lived Twelve little girls in two straight lines. I just, I you know, you can e easily memorize Madeline after you've read it a hundred times, and so over and over again, I just told her, you know, all I could remember of the book, and she just sat there. And I remember going to the orthopedist and saying, um, you know, I I didn't hurt my child. I wasn't trying to hurt my child. And he said, he said, I have ten children. <laughs> I can well imagine <laughs> how one of them can dislocate their elbow. But it was just, I just remember being, you know, in the waiting room, your first child, and you're in the waiting room, and something's wrong with her, and she's in pain, and all she wanted was for me to hold her and say, over and over again, the Madeline book, in an old house in Paris that was covered with vines. So, um, she loved Madeline, and she was always really little. Mary Mart was always tiny, so much tinier um, than the rest of the kids in her class. And so, Madeline, you know, was very small. There's a birth sampler. Beatrix Potter birth sampler. There's the little door thing that I made. Oh, Miss, oh, Mrs. Rabbit and Mrs. Tiggy Winkle. Um, Babar is in here. There's some Babar designs. My kids didn't get into Babar. Um, there's a couple of those. Um, I'll show you. There's Paddington Bear, Spot the Dog, and this duck. I think I remember seeing some books. Um, those weren't big. Miffy, I remember when that became a cartoon. There's a few Miffy designs. There's more designs for each one. I was just trying to flip through it quickly so you could get an idea of what was available. Paddington, more Paddington. Um, duck. And then some Winnie the Pooh. Classic Pooh, of course. I really like those. Um, there's a, uh, oh, Angelina Ballerina. I made that one. There's, is that her little brother Henry? Or is Henry somebody else? Um, I think that's supposed to be Tinkerbell. Um, Tinkerbell and Peter Pan. So these are all really small, really quick. This is one I wanted to make and never did. Angelina Ballerina. I loved her. I thought the books were so, so, so pretty. So, and then Apple Tree Farm. I don't know what that is, but. So this is a book that, um, Everybody loves that. Isn't that nice? So, if you have little ones to stitch something little for, this is one you could probably track down on uh, Amazon or eBay. All right, and the only, okay, I did get a couple of new charts. This one I got from 123 Stitch. After I finished the bookshelf, I enjoyed it so much. It was just a simple, uncomplicated stitch. I really, really enjoyed it. My daughters are watching Robin Hood right now, th that mini series. Um, my older daughter watched it all the way through, and now she's watching it with my younger daughter. And they're, my younger daughter is very into it. Um, she has a book, I think it was written in, 19, in the 1920s. Is it William McSpaden? I'm not sure about who the author is, but um, whenever there's myths or folk tales, my daughter like picks one 
version and decides that's the real version and all the other versions are wrong. And she gets very hostile when um, the Robin TV show deviates from this particular retelling. It's a it's a novel. It's I mean, it's novel length, um, but she really likes it. So I thought I would do that for her. I showed it to her, and she really likes it. I like stitching with green and brown. I also saw on Stash Unload, and then had an absolute fit, and went on eBay and got these two booklets based on the Country Diary of an Edwardian Woman series. Um, this is the Country Diary of an Edwardian Lady. And I think in the past there have been dishes based on it. Um, we use it in our homeschool. What I do is it's her diary throughout the year, her observations that she sees in nature um, with quotations, old wives' tales about the date or the month, um, bits of poetry. So here's a page from May. So it's got her watercolor on this side, and then poems, sayings um, that, that have to do with May. So what I do usually, I have, um, so here's June. And it tells, like, this is what she did or saw on June 15th, the dates. It's just a beautiful, beautiful book. And what I usually do is I usually, I have e little easels for books around the homeschool room. And I usually have it opened to one of the pages, well, two of the pages for the month. So that the kids can glance at it if they're so inclined. We try to put things in their way. It's also called strewing, when you, you know, you leave things lying around. Um, it works really well when they're younger. They get wise to it. Later on, they know that you're putting things in their way. So, this is a facsimile of her diary. And so, when I found out that there were uh, cross-stitch designs based on it, um, I wanted them. Now they're not really in my style, but I think I could probably, uh, I really like this one on the front cover. I think that's very pretty. And here's the back with some more. There's also a DVD set of some people we watched the first month. I think we watched January. It goes month by month through her diary, sort of acting out the, the diary. Um, the girls thought it was weird and wouldn't watch it. I may give it another try without them. Someday I may really, really enjoy it without their commentary. The commentary of um, two teenage girls watching Edwardian ladies enjoy themselves. Is... So anyways, I got those two. And Robin Hood. Alright. So, I haven't gotten any... Is that it for cross stitch? That's it for cross stitch. Alright, so knitting and books. And I don't have too much of either. I'm really really want to cast on a shawl. And I have patterns and yarn to cast on many shawls. I just have to find one and commit to it. So, once again, I'm showing you my unfinished monkey socks on yarn that I dyed. I finished one, and then I got to the toe decreases on the other, and you would think I would just finish it. I cast on more socks instead of finishing these beautiful socks. Partly because I know I'm not going to be wearing them anytime soon. Um, and partly because oh, I just have this thing about finishing. So I showed you my peacock socks that I had started. And I'm working down the foot. I've turned the heel and I'm working down the foot. Both of them, I think. 
looks like I've just turned the heel of this one and I'm still doing the, the decreases. When um, my girls had a dance recital, well, it's four performances of a dance recital last weekend, and I was knitting on these socks. And it's just amazing to me when you're knitting in public, you know, you expect older ladies to come up to you and ask you what you're doing and tell you that they still crochet or they still knit or that they used to do both or they used to do one or the other and, you know, had to stop for, you know, whatever reason. That's, that's pretty common. But, but the, the thing that, and I enjoy that. I enjoy that connection with strangers, you know, just because of the, the craft. But what I absolutely love is how it attracts children. It attracts children, boys and girls. They are so attracted when they see you knitting. And they stare and they ask you how you do it. And so I show them. Um, and it's, it's, it's almost sad to me because when you read about the history of sock knitting, for instance, knitting socks or stockings, that was something that was something that very young girls had to do. They, they had to do that to stay warm. You know, they had to do that for their family. And it's just, and you think how sad that was, these little girls, you know, working their fingers to the bone on embroidery lace, knitting, to either to provide for their families warmth or, you know, some money for their families. They had to do it and the hours that they worked. And then these girls this, these age, you know, five, six, just mesmerized, mesmerized watching it. Um, I don't know. I just think it's interesting. And I, I like it that they're they're so attracted to it. And then, so I started, those you've seen before, I started, um, this is Knit Pick Stroll Yarn in the color Make Believe. I think it's one of their hand painted. And it is just so pretty. Of course, these are the colors I like. Purples and aquas and greens. Isn't that fun how it knits up into those thin, thin stripes? So I was going to cast the second one on because I, I told you I always cast on the first one and the second one so that they can get done roughly at the same time. But I didn't. When I first got my dies that I bought, I dyed a couple of 50, uh, several 50 gram balls just you know as an experiment and I was like what am I gonna do with a 50 gram ball of yarn because a pair of socks for me it takes about 75 uh, or maybe 70 how long is I usually have about 35 left over can't do the math so this was one of the ones that I'd experimented with but I only had a 50 gram ball so I decided I just made it six and a half inches, the leg, instead of seven. And I'm using um, the leftover antique mauve that I dyed, that I'm using as the monkey socks. I'm using that for the heel and then the toe. And if it has to be for most of the foot, too, that's fine. Because there's antique, antique ivory in this. So I dropped the heel. I finished the heel in the car today. Um, cause of my back, but, um, and I just need to join up and then do the gusset de decreases. And now I have no more sock needles, so I can't start the second one of that or the second one of the make-believe, but I'll probably finish the monkey socks soon and then start one of them. So that is all for knitting. So I wanted to tell you what I've been reading or what I've been listening to. Um, my husband, when I met him, was a huge Patrick O'Brien fan. I can't remember if there's 20 or 21 books in this series of British naval um, historical fiction. Um, it's during the Napoleonic Wars. And was, I'm not interested in the British Navy, not interested in violence, punishments and 
gory details. I'm not interested in that. Um, but he would just read them over and over again. And occasionally, when we would be driving in the car, he would ask me to read them. This was the days before Audible. He would ask me to read them, and I'd just open them up, and I'd be reading them. And I, I was impressed by the, by the writing style, but I couldn't deal with the um, gory details. So I knew they were there, but I ignored them. Um, so years ago when the Horatio Hornblower movies, not movies, but uh, A&E special movies came out, um, he wanted to watch those, and I watched those with him. I always left the room during the gory parts. Um, and I had a lot of friends, male and female, that were reading the books. And so I read the Horatio Hornblower books. I think there may be nine. Maybe I read five or six. I read about half of them. And they're fast reads. They're adventure, sailing, um, and they're good books. But I'm not interested in the British Navy. I'm sorry. I'm not interested in that. Um, so I know the first one was a movie, Commander, Master and Commander, with the actor that was in Gladiator. And I didn't go and see it because I'm not interested in it. Um, but Jerry bought on my Audible, Jerry decided he was going to listen to all of the books again. And so he used like 20 of my Audible credits and bought the whole series on Audible. And he did. He listened to them all. And we had a disagreement because I said, well, maybe I'll listen to them too. And I want to hear Simon Vance read them. And he said, no, 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 no. I want Patrick Tull. And he had some friends that were listening to him too. And I don't know how they outvoted me. I don't understand how they had any say in it. But anyway, so we got Patrick Tull. Patrick Tull, I'm used to him now. He's a very good narrator. He's about two hours longer per book than Simon Vance. So anyways, I have started reading the, these again. And these are not like Horatio Hornblower books. These books have much more dialogue much more plot that is not just British Navy. And see, I don't, I'm on book 10, and I don't know anything about a ship, okay? When he says that, when he gives this long scene of sailing, and he's rigging this mast, and these are spars that are going to go, and he's telling the reefers to do this, I don't know what he's talking about. But, but he pulls me along with his narrative style. I am, I am so tense and I am so excited while they're chasing these other, this other ship and while he's setting these stuncils he I don't know what a stuncil is. Now, occasionally when I'm reading, I will look at a map of a book. I will look at a diagram of, I will look at a diagram of a ship and it'll say stuncils and mainsails and, but for me, I don't have to know exactly what he's saying because I get so caught up in his narrative style. And that happens when I'm reading it or when I'm listening to it. Now, I do have to know exactly where he is. And so I read with the third edition. It has more in it. These Harbors and High Seas. So the one I'm reading right now, that I'm listening to right now, is The Far Side of the World. And um, I think it's like book 10 or 11. Well, anyways, Fortune of War, Desolation Island, Surgeon's Mate. What I'm saying is, you don't have to love the Napoleonic era British Navy to read these books. The dialogue and the character development and the plots drag you along. Um, my husband reads everything. And he said one of his first impressions of this book was Jane Austen for men. Now, my husband likes Jane Austen. He's a man. But the dialogue is on that le level. The character development, the plot is on that level. Now, there is a lot of mathematics. There is a lot of sailing. There is a lot of history. A lot of history. I didn't realize um, in that era War of 1812. I didn't realize how that the British were in the Pacific Ocean. I mean, I know the British are in the Pacific Ocean, but on the North American coast of the Pacific Ocean, I, I, I just never pictured them there. 
maybe I'm an idiot, but I, I never, and it is, it is, you know, odd for me to read it and when they encounter the Americans, because I'm so on the side of Aubrey and Matron, and that when they encounter Americans, you know, I was like, which side am I supposed to, who am I supposed to be rooting for here? But it's so detailed, it's so much history, it's, it's so much naval terminology, but I feel like the narrative pulls you through that. I don't have to grab the diagram of the ship every single time to get through the book. I could do that, and sometimes I do, but I don't, I don't need to because I'm pulled by the characters, the returning characters, the characters that have been sailing with him for so many um, books. So this, The Far Side of the World, he starts in... They're coming out of the Mediterranean, and they go around. Now, so Jack Aubrey is the captain. His very best friend, who comes along on all these sailing expeditions with him as the surgeon, is a naturalist. So um, he knows nothing about naval life. So he's constantly having to have naval life explained to him, and then so we get the explanations through him. Also, we... Um, you hear about real history that was happening. Co Captain Cook, um, Botany Bay. Um, I think the Mutiny on the Bounty might have been in one. But as he's as they're going through all these islands, um, the naturalist Stephen Maturin is making note of the flora and fauna that he sees, and also of the um, tribal peoples, the native peoples to these places. Um, so it's fascinating. It's, it's fascinating from geography, from history, um, just an adventure novel. It's an adventure novel, and you don't have to have, um, well, you might, you might have to have a diagram of a ship with you. I have to have a map. I have to have a map when I'm reading Lord of the Rings. I have to have the map with me at all times. Um, so I'm on the far side of the world, and I'm really, really enjoying that. And I'm enjoying it, and I, I'm not interested in British naval history at all. Um, another book that we've had for years is a companion book, Lobscoose and Spotted Dog. And I think a mother and a daughter went through, and every single time a food was mentioned, because there's lots of mentions of food, there's mentions of the music, there's mention of when he goes on shore, he may be on shore for half a book. And while he's on shore, while Jack is on shore, you've got dealings with his wife, with his mother-in-laws, with his creditors. You know, they try to get him into debtor's prison a couple of times. You have a lot of onshore um, episodes. Uh, Stephen Maturin is also a spy. He's half Irish and half, is it Catiline uh, Spanish? And he's spying um, on behalf of the... The, the British government. Um, so his dealings with the Spaniards are, are always interesting. But any time that there's a, a, menu, uh, a recipe, these two women have hunted it down. So from the um, first page, in these pages you will find a wealth of authentic early 19th century recipes for foods such as burgoo, ship's biscuits, skilly golly, drowned baby, sea pie, figgy dowdy, soused hog's face, Solomon Gundy, jam roly-poly, portable soup, and of course, spotted dog. With this book, you can create a feast with sucking pig and Christmas pudding, recreate Clarissa Oak's bridal dinner, or learn how Jack Stewart Killick might have made coffee. Um, so that is, so in the book that I'm reading, um, when he was invited to the gun room for a dinner, they made a pudding in the shape of the Galapagos Islands for him. And so these women have tracked down ways that might have been made. And I think they give two, one with jelly, like gelatin, and one in a, in a different manner. Um, the naturalist is once marooned on an island with birds and he's unable to, um, so here, floating archipelago 
in the shape of the Galapagos. And it says that um, Judging from the cookery books of the period, it appears that the recipes crossed the channel in both directions and that during Jack's time, there were several hybrid versions adding to the confusion. Since the pastry cook in the far side of the world was from Danzig, it is reasonable to suppose that he inclined toward the continental or meringue side of the question. On the other hand, it is dreadfully difficult to make the Galapagos in meringue and much less so to perform the operation with cake and jelly. We have tried both and we felt it would only be fair to offer a choice. So... I'm very, very detailed. Um, he was, the naturalist was marooned on an island filled with birds. And in order to sustain life until um, the ship came back for him, he had to boil guano in little puddles in the sun in order to survive. And true to their mission, of putting um, everything in this book, there is a recipe for boiled you know what. So it's just a fun, it's just a fun book to give you more information about the book. And I am at one hour and one minute, so I have overstayed my allotted time. But thank you for watching. Thank you, especially if you've stayed um, through to the end. And I hope to be back in a couple of weeks and show you some more finishes and some more starts and some more progress. And I hope you have a great time until I see you again. Thank you.